Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Taylor and I'm a lecturer in civil engineering. So this is unit six and in this unit we're going to look at switches and crossings. So this is the sixth unit in the module and we're going to look at switches and crossings and we're going to pay particular attention to the geometric design. We're going to look at the speeds and the clearances and we're also going to look at the inspection, maintenance and the manufacturing processes for these devices. So in this unit, I'm going to introduce the names and functions of the various components of a switch and crossing unit. I'm going to describe the geometrical design. And I'm also going to show how they're manufactured. So at the end of this unit, you should be able to identify the key components of a switch and crossing unit. Apply the center line method to switch and crossing geometry calculations. Select an appropriate switch type from a standard SNC layout table and appraise the various design factors appropriate for the installation of a new SNC layout. So let's start off by looking at some of the basics. Switches and crossings play an essential role in connecting the rail network. We use them to guide trains from one track to another and to enable lines to cross paths. Put simply, they're the junctions that allow us to create a multi-lined, multi-routed rail network. At Network Rail, we own over 20,000 switch and crossing units. They come in many different shapes and sizes, and all are made to measure for their specific location. To understand how switches and crossings work, we first got to look at the wheel-rail interaction. Train wheels move along the rails guided only by the pound-coin-sized area of wheel that sits on the railhead. The wheel rim, or flange, doesn't normally touch the rail. Flanges are only a last resort to prevent the wheels becoming derailed. A switch can guide a wheel in one of two directions. A crossing creates a gap in the rail for the flange to pass through. This is a switch, also known as a point. It's the moving part of the switch and crossing layout and is made up of two long blades which can move across to guide the train one way or another. This is the switch rail, and this is called the toe. This is called the stock rail, it's a non-moving part of the switch. The two switch blades are fixed to each other by a stretcher bar to ensure that when one is against its stock rail, the other is fully clear and will provide room for the wheel flange to pass through cleanly. This is a crossing. It's the non-moving part of the switch and crossing layout that allows a train to pass in either direction once the switch has been set. This is the nose of the crossing. Either side of the crossing area, wing and check rails are provided to assist the guidance of the wheel sets through the crossing. Crossings can be either fabricated, made up of two machined rails joined together, or they can be cast as a single unit. Modern crossings are now cast from manganese steel, which is an advanced alloy that gets harder with use. This is an important property, as the nose of the crossing can take high impact loads as train wheels pass through. My name is Lawrence Walton, and I'm a graduate engineer working for Network Rail. I'm here today to teach you about switches and crossings. The most simple form of SNC is the turnout. This is a left-hand turnout. As you can see, it diverges from the main route in a leftward direction. This is how it works. 
In normal mode, the left-hand wheel rolls along the switch rail and there's flangeway clearance for the right wheel to continue along the stock rail. The inside surface of the right flange is kept on course by the check rail. This restrains the wheel set and ensures it is directed along the correct route. Meanwhile, the left wheel transfers contact between the different parts of the crossing. That's where there's a high impact load. In the reverse, the right wheel rolls over the switch rail and follows its geometry. The inside surface of the left flange is guided by the check, forcing it to follow the stock rail on the new route. And the right hand wheel makes a crossing, again impacting a load on the crossing nose. There are many different types of switch and crossing on the network. They include turnouts, diamonds, crossovers and slip diamonds. The type we use is determined by a number of factors, including the number of lines involved, frequency of use and running line speed. Trains travelling at high speeds need long switches and crossings. At low speeds, such as in stations, trains can make tighter turns. Train movements across the network are set and controlled by signalers, who use switches to set routes for trains. Switches can be propelled by various devices. One of the simplest forms is a ground frame setup, a series of rods and cams attached to levers in signal boxes. These are now largely being replaced by remotely operated hydraulic and electromechanical devices. Seen by rail sides all across the country. This is an HW2000 points machine. This is electromechanical. What we have here is your drive motor. To check the motor has done its job, over here we have an interlocking and detection system. Detection tells us when the points have completed their travel and locked. Locking holds the points in this state so they cannot be physically moved, so when a train runs over the top, it remains in position. Facing point locks are one of the most important safety features on the SNC layout. They ensure that the points cannot be moved when set. This is important because failure to lock the switches could cause a derailment. As engineers, we face an ongoing challenge to maintain and improve our switch and crossing assets. Trains can create large impact and lateral forces as they change course, and these forces can cause wear and deformation. Switches and crossings therefore have a limited lifespan before we need to replace them. Less than 5% of track miles are made up of switches and crossings, but over 17% of our maintenance budget is spent on them. We'll continue to research and develop new inspection techniques and material usage to increase their performance. It's all about creating a network that's safe, reliable and efficient. It's what we do. So you can see the various components of an SNC unit, including the switch rails, the tow, the heel of the switch rails, the stretcher bars, the check rails, the crossing, sometimes known as a frog, the wing rails, and the running rails. The term turnout is often used, and that is a single railway junction comprising of a switch and a crossing, but generally in the railway industry, they'll be referred to as S and C units. So to start with, we can quite simply have a left-hand turnout or a right-hand turnout. You can see on the left, a Y turnout, and on the right, a three-way turnout. Now, a three-way turnout is often called a tandem turnout because it has two switches and crossings, although it has three routes. So here you can see a diamond crossing on the left with the coloured arrows showing the two alternative routes. And on the right hand side we have what's called a single slip. And we can see that on the right hand side of that we have the orange arrows which show only one route. But on the other side we can either take the blue route or we can throw the, the switch and travel the, the red route. So on the left hand side 
we can see a double slip and we can see the two alternative routes shown by the coloured arrows. So in the case of the left hand route approaching the double slip we can turn off to the left or we can continue diagonally forward. In the case of the red arrows we can continue forward or we can turn off to the right. Trap or catch points are often used to protect a main line. For example if we have a runaway loco or a runaway wagon rather than rolling onto their main line it will approach a runoff area or what's known as a sand drag. Here you can see a real example of catch points and here we can see we have a signal and just in front of the signal you'll see that the catch points are set which would cause a runaway vehicle to travel into the sand drag and protect any vehicles in the mainline railway. So this image shows a locomotive that's uh, rolled away from its position and rather than rolling onto the main line uh, it's hit the sand drag and unfortunately it's uh, rolled over on its side. Uh, typically you'd want the vehicle to remain upright uh, but in this case it's rolled over so we're going to see some quite complex lifting arrangements to get that back up onto its bogies and ultimately then dragged away to be maintained or repaired. One of the best ways to see SNC units in action is to go and stand on the platforms of Waverley Station or walk through Princess Street Gardens where there's various viewpoints where you can see the main approaches to the platforms at Waverley Station. So I've just taken a second photograph from this viewpoint and I've just zoomed in a little bit and here we can see from left to right the end of a tandem crossing, a diamond crossing, a double slip and also a single slip. So I've zoomed in again and here we can see on the left a single slip and then just above it a double slip. So the question is why would we actually need this SNC layout? So I've just zoomed in again and here you can see on the left hand side the beginning of the tandem crossing showing the two sets of switch rails and on the right hand side we can see two crossings and all I've done there is just highlight the crossings of the frogs and in one case the switch rails. So as we approach the single slip and double slip SNC units we can see if we follow the red arrows that this will allow the train to travel to three separate platforms from that one line. So here we can see as we approach the blue line we cross the single slip and we can only travel into one platform but if we follow the yellow arrows as we cross the double slip we can move from that line into one of two platforms. And the reason why this SNC configuration is here is just to allow the signaller to move trains from two different platforms or from platforms to different lines. So it increases the flexibility of the layout of the station. So another good place to see complex switches and crossings is the approach to Glasgow Central Station. If you take the Shots line from Edinburgh, which is the longer line that goes past Vault House and through West Calder, you can then arrive at Central Station and as you pass through the approaches to Central Station over the River Clyde, you'll see the extremely complex switches and crossing units. So this photograph was taken from one of the end of the platforms at Central Station with a zoom lens. And here you can see how complex the SNC units are in the approaches to Central Station. You'll note that there's a 20 mile an hour speed limit on all lines. This is just due to the complexity of the track work in the SNC units on the approach to this station. So just when you thought the track work was complex enough, you then have to consider the overhead line electrification. So here we can see an example of a drawing showing design information for overhead line electrification as it crosses the various switches and crossing units. This is a separate subject in itself and is beyond the scope of this lecture, but we'll have a look at that at a later date. So just as every other moving part of the railway needs to be inspected, switches and crossing units must be inspected, maintained to ensure safety. Okay, so one of the tasks for this unit is to look at the rail accident report from the RAIB for the derailment at Greyrig, which happened on the 23rd of February 2007. And you can see from the aerial photograph here, this was a significant accident. 
So you can see some extracts from the RAIB report. You can see that there was a fracture of the first stretcher bar bracket and failure of the lock stretcher bar to rail joint. There was failure of threaded fastener joints. There was fatigue fracture of the third permanent way stretcher bar. And there was failure of all stretcher bar to rail joints. You can see from the photograph that there were bolts missing. There was a fractured stretcher bar and there was a second stretcher bar actually missing. The report stated that it was not possible to conclude whether it was an increased load or a change in the maintenance activities that led to the failure. It also stated that tightening of fasteners during maintenance visits is not recorded in network rail systems. So clearly there were some changes to the systems that were required. So now we're going to look at the design and manufacture of switches and crossings. Firstly, we're going to look at measurement of crossing angles. So mathematically, angles are measured in degrees, minutes and seconds. However, on site, a protractor is not very useful. So in railways, angles are often quoted using the unit method of angular measurement, e.g. 1 in 10. And this is sometimes known as a frog number. So I'm now going to explain the centre line method. So if we consider this also this triangle ABD, and we wish to measure angle between BA and BD, that angle will be ABD. And if AD is, is of length B and C is the midpoint of AD, then AC equals CD, which is equal to B over 2, and this is the centre line. If BC is, is of length A, then in the centre line method, the angle ABD is 1 in N, where N equals A over B. So let's look at a worked example. At a point beyond the nose of a crossing, the distance between the outer edges of the rails is measured as 500 mil. The distance from the centre of this line to the theoretical nose of the crossing is measured as 2000 millimetres. So N is 2000 divided by 500, and therefore this is a 1 in 4 crossing. But you must note that in practice the nose is blunt, so on site two widths are taken and an angle is taken as a difference between the widths divided by the distance between them. So now we're going to look at turnout design. So circular turnout comprises a circular curve diverging from a usually straight track. To manufacture a switch and crossing we need to know the crossing angle as shown. And we also need to know the intersection point of the diverging rails and the distance to the intersection point is known as the lead length. So we assume a straight piece of track with rails EF and CD. The gauge of the track is G and we assume a diverging track PJ. PJ is of a circular radius R about a point O. PJ intersects CD at point X. Now the tangent at X is XZ and we wish to know the angle CXZ. So as the curve is circular, we know that EF is tangential to OP at point P. Therefore EF is at right angles to OP. And as CD is parallel to EF, XCO must also be a right angle triangle. So also OC must equal R minus G. So we can see that length OP equals R. So by Pythagoras theorem, CX equals the square root of 2RG minus G squared. And the length CX is known as the theoretical lead length. The theoretical lead length is the distance from the start of the switch to the crossing point. So now we need to work out the crossing angle. So constructing line PX, we can see that triangle ZPX is an isosceles triangle. Therefore, angle ZXP is half the crossing angle. So angle CXP is also half the crossing angle. So the tangent of this angle is PX over CX. So tan CXZ over 2 equals G over CX. So we know that tan CXZ over 2 equals G over CX. And then using the CLM, 
This could be written as 1 over 2n equals g over cx. And if we transpose this, cx equals 2gn. So we now know that cx equals 2gn. So our crossing angle is n equals the square root of 2r minus g over 4g. Well, for a given n, we can calculate the radius, which is 4n squared plus 1 multiplied by g divided by 2. So you must note that the theoretical lead length is longer than the actual lead length, as it depends on the thickness of the blunt nose of the crossing and a switch entry angle and switch planing radius. So we can see here that the planing radius is different from the radius of the switch rail. So steel is removed during the manufacturing process by planing. The actual lead length of a natural turnout, LN, is made up of two parts, LP and LX. LP is the part of the rail that has been planed, and so is not a full rail section. It tapers to a point. So the actual turnout comprises several components. The planing length, the planing radius, the switch radius, the turnout radius, the crossing angle, and the lead length. And we can specify these for manufacture, but in practice they're taken from standard tables. You can see an extract from the Network Rail Track Design Handbook, NRLT TRK2049. And this is taken from section A13. So we can see for each switch type, we can see the natural angle, turnout speed, length of planing, the planing radius, and so on. So if a circular natural turnout is used for a diverging route intending to run parallel to a main line, a reverse curve would be required. In the interest of passenger comfort, transition turnouts are used instead. So transition turnouts have some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages being that the turnout speed is usually higher for the same switch size and crossing angle. The straight over straight crossing is easier to manufacture and subsequent replacement becomes a lot easier. The geometry for a crossover is much simpler and allows for higher speeds. The disadvantages include they could be longer, so they may be difficult to place where space is restricted. The rails feature several changes in, in geometry. Initial manufacture and subsequent replacement is therefore more difficult. If a divergent route is curved, speed may be restricted, as transition to a straight and then transition back to a curve is required. So on the through route, there isn't normally a speed requirement. The speed is the same as the design speed of the main line. On a turnout route, a lower speed is usually required. The factors which must be checked when calculating the maximum permissible speed over a given set of S and C E R, the deficiency on the switch and turnout radii, and the D dash over the change between the switch and the turnout over the change between the switch and the turnout. The standard geometry checks D, E dash, and E dash, and E over D, etc., for the route out of the turnout, i.e., anything following on from the turnout radius. And here in the image on the left, we can see a 20 miles per hour speed restriction on one of the switching crossing units at Slateford Station. So now we're going to have a look at crossing design. So consider the straight over straight diamond crossing. To manufacture this, we need the lengths of all four sides, the total length along AD, the distance AP, where BP is perpendicular to AC, and AP is known as the lead of the crossing B over crossing A. So as the track gauges are the same, the length AB equals BD equals CD equals AC. So BC and AD are at right angles. So BP equals the track gauge G. Therefore, sine BAP equals BP over AB, which is equal to G over AB. Or using the CLM method, 4N divided by 4N squared plus 1 equals G over AB. So we know 4N over 4N squared plus 1 equals G over AB. If we rearrange that, we can find the length AB. And AB equals BD equals CD and AC. So AD is 2 times AQ. 
and the angle BAQ is half the angle BAP. So AD equals 2AQ, which equals to 2AB cos BAQ, or using the CLM method, AD can be rearranged to equal G times the square root of 4N squared plus 1. So finally, the lead AP is given by AB cos BAC, or we can use the CLM method and AP equals NG minus G over 4N. So as well as the geometric design of SNC units, we're now going to have a look at some of the general design factors that we must consider. So some of the design factors we should consider include the speed of the turnout, the turnout size, the curvature of the main line, the proximity of underbridges, and the proximity of overbridges, for example, clearance issues associated with overhead line electrification and the difficulty of installation using cranes. So we must consider the proximity of adjacent structures, as shown in the image above. We may have general problems if we're in an overhead line area, so care is going to be required with wire runs, anchor positions and support for contact wires. There's going to be various interfaces with signalling, and if they're close to platforms, we must consider centre and end throw issues. We also need to consider the stressing of SNC units. So let's now have a look at how we manufacture switches and crossings. Welcome to Progress Rail. We're based at San Diego in Nottingham and we're the main manufacturer of switches and crossings for the rail industry. Fabricated switches and crossings are manufactured from normal pieces of rail with a series of machining operations from a variation of milling, turning, planing, welding and final assembly to make bespoke products for network rail. What you're going to see today is the manufacturing process from start to finish. You're going to see the rails being cut, machined, milled, welded, bolted together and then dispatched. The first part of the process is cutting the rails to length from the CNC saw machine. CNC means computer numeric controlled, meaning the sawmill is pre-programmed to follow an individual switch or crossing design. I will upload that program from the drawing office, then this machine will drill and cut to whatever is required. A big bit of kit, but when you when you consider some of the rails that it's handling are 120 foot long, you do need a big bit of kit. I've got 16 different size drills that you can choose from. I've got a tungsten carbide saw blade that's cut through very easily. Once the rails have been sawed, drilled and tagged, they go to be machined into completely new shapes. Planing gradually slices rails down to narrow the profile to create sections such as switch blades. Well, this is a planing machine. Well, it's important to get it straight or follow the line, the curve and the bending that's in the rail. Once we're going to get that, it'll give us a true running line for when we assemble it afterwards. While the planing machine slices down the original rail in long sweeps, Milling machines grind down other parts of the same rail to more complex profiles, allowing it to fit into other parts of the switch and crossing layout. It's an Elga Mill milling machine. There's a thing that's special about this machine, it's got an indexing head that can work on any angle. Change the head over, it can work any angle that comes along, from vertical, horizontal, 45 degrees, any sort of angle that needs to be like. In another area of the workshop, a part welded crossing is being prepared. Two long sections of rail have been machined into shape. An insert bar is placed between them to create adequate width, and they are then raised into the vertical to be welded together. It's an electro slag welding machine. The welding heat is derived from the electrical resistance of the slag bath to the amperage that we're using. 
welding takes three hours to complete, but it's important that the weld is strong enough on this high load component. Once joined and cooled, the V-crossing component is machined to the finished profile. The V will then need to be joined to a longer rail called a leg. The process used is called flash butt welding. When you switch the light switch on its own and the two connectors come together, obviously they heat up. This is exactly the same process, very simple. Pass electric current through these two copper plates, into these two copper plates, very high current. It melts the end of this rail by touching them together. And then when they've become fluid enough, this side has got a big ram on it, puts it against that side, and they become one rail. been pushed together and now it's one solid piece of rail. This is a much stronger weld than the Fermat weld because you're actually melting the ends of the rail and they're actually forming the material and making one piece of rail. At the end of the machining processes, the switch and crossing component parts, collated, checked and tagged, are ready to be sent off to be assembled. When you see the components being made at Sandacre, quite hard to understand what they're for. It's only when they've been assembled and our site at Beeson, it starts to make sense. All the components, i.e. the jigsaw pieces, come to this site and we put them together to prove that the switches and crossings go together correctly. Once we've proven they go together correctly, we will then dispatch them to site. This is one of our finished products ready for dispatch. These switches are powered by our drive units in the middle of the bearers. Judging by the length of these switches, these will be used in high speed rail. Some of the components we use are cast chairs, which are made at a Sandaker site. You've got screws that are screwed to the concrete bearers. You've got pads to stop vibration. You've got a clip, which is called an E-clip, which has got an insulation to stop signal failure. This is a switch rail, look at its profile. This started off life as a normal rail. This was manufactured, milled, bent in position to site at Sandacre. It's quite an achievement how the rail starts off life like this and finished with a profile like this. This is not going to be disassembled. This is a modular unit. This will be loaded by cranes onto a tilting train and sent to site, which in this case is Scotland. This is Network Rail's new modular train. This allows us to ship switches and crossings in modular form. This is a genius idea. Before this, we used to have to dismantle the switches and crossings we'd assembled on the yard and send them straight to site for reassembly. We don't need to do this anymore. Instead, we load the pre-assembled switches and crossings to the train. We tilt the train to allow it through tunnels and stations. This is delivered straight to site, offloaded, saving time and money. We're very proud of the work we do here. The manufacturing unit has been going for over 50 years. There's a lot of skill, dedication, and we pride ourselves on the quality of work that we turn out. So once all the manufacturing work is finished and we've done a trial assembly, we're then ready to actually install the SNC units on site. So traditionally SNC units are assembled on site. There's lots of different components and this is generally quite a complicated process. It's almost like assembling a huge technical jigsaw puzzle. Replacing of SNC units can therefore be very disruptive if you take this approach. It can also require possession over several nights. So nowadays, what the railway engineers do is pre-assemble them off-site and deliver them to site on specially designed wagons to massively decrease the possession time and the length of closures required. The stressing of SNC is much more complex than stressing plain lines. There are more constraints imposed on pulling points and rail lengths. 
the sections of the rail may also be unclipped, and we need to ensure SFT in both rails is the same. If the SFT is not equal, this could cause a misalignment at the toe, and the misalignment could cause excessive wear and vibration, leading to failure of the bolts. Many rails in SNC are quite short, so the pull is going to be small, and this increases the risk of error. So that's the end of the lecture for Unit 6. You now have to look at the tutorial questions, the additional reading, and some of the additional tasks in the virtual learning environment. So the next unit is going to be Unit 7, Signalling and Train Control, where we're going to look at signalling systems and train protection systems. So thanks for listening. Bye for now.